Welcome, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, before we get started with our fantastic guest, I would like to thank some folks that we always thank. We'd like to thank BrassAndWinds.com. Brass and Winds, Quinn the Eskimo Company, whenever we're looking for brass or wind instruments, we always start with BrassAndWinds.com. They've been very supportive of us, and we think they're the best in the business. We are Truer MU and Willow Music. If you're looking for a better way to learn the piano, try Truer MU. We have a series of self-guided courses that can help you from the very beginning. And if you'd like to study with a person, Willow Music is a better way to learn music. Check us out at WillowSchoolGA.com. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce a guest to you. Those of you who are familiar with Willow School are familiar with our guitar instructor, Mr. Josh Misco. Mr. Misco co-produced a song called I Found Myself with a man named Ian Osborne. And I was very eager, since we'd already interviewed Josh, I thought it would be terrific to interview Mr. Ian Osborne. Uh, Ian Osborne, before I introduce him formally to you, uh, he has uh, produced such shows as Phineas and Ferb, music for such shows as Phineas and Ferb, Power Rangers, and Kicking It. And he's been involved in commercials for companies like Zanes and NASA and Nordic Track. In 2014, he co-founded uh, The Infinites with his partner, Cash Calloway. Mr. Ian Osborne, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you very much. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I didn't tell the audience yet that I found myself uh, has scored millions and millions of views on TikTok. Uh, that's a really wonderful accomplishment. Congratulations. Thanks so much. Yeah, we're excited to see how it's been received um, just in all the different platforms and then also through the partners that have picked it up to kind of spread the message um, like Eden, E-D-I-N, and um, NAMI and those kind of organizations. So I think it's over 500,000 um, streams on Spotify as well now, and um, we're excited to see where it goes from here. That's extraordinary. Well, we're going to talk about the song closer to the end. Before we go any further, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, first of all, uh, tell us about yourself. Uh, do you play an instrument? What, uh, what do you do musically? Yeah, I started off playing guitar. I started at about 10 years old. You know, um, my dad played guitar and had played through college and that kind of thing and had an old Takamini uh, acoustic guitar that I started playing on. And um, ever since then, I kind of caught the bug and started singing and playing in church and stuff like that growing up in the Dallas area. And then um, over time, I've kind of picked up a lot of different instruments. I'm pretty proficient at most of the string kind of instruments, electric guitars, acoustic guitars, bass guitars. Um, I'm actually going to be playing in Josh's uh, band on bass guitar here uh, as he's touring this year. So that'll be really fun. And um, picked up keys along the way, as you can imagine, you know, scoring for different shows and stuff like that has to has a lot to do these days with, um, you know, being able to, to play uh, keys to a certain extent. So pick that up, uh, play some percussion instruments. And then I have actually my uh, my vocal degree um, from uh, a small school in LA uh, doing vocal performance. So kind of all over the place there. Um, and I get to use all of it, which is super fun. So yeah, so you're like a music educator, except you've gone a different direction. Yeah, and I, I've taught before in the past um, for various, you know, schools and stuff. And I, that's really close to my heart, too. I still um, I'm involved with a uh, non nonprofit here town called helping our music evolve or home for short and it's like a multi you know thousand square foot uh facility that has stages and rehearsal rooms and has a studio there and i've been um the uh like uh, in in-house producer there for the last uh, year or so helping out build that community and, and teaching artists how to how to take advantage of that kind of stuff and some some of those things so yes absolutely i, I love the education piece as well but close my window here sure sure go ahead got a little bit a little bit so, of sun coming in there we go <laughs> well it's nice ambiance yeah yeah what is producing exactly for those of us in our audience that may be younger musicians maybe they're 17 18 or thinking about getting into the business what is producing yeah for me producing is is working with people um that's that's the biggest part of it i think it's a it's kind of um, engineering a good collaboration is another way to think about it. So I try to come in and work with an artist typically will have a song or they'll have an idea of where they would like to go. Um, and I'll sit with them and either write that idea or take a song that they already have and start to create around that to make, um, to make it kind of fit in the styles that they like in the, 
in the um, references that they might have brought in of other artists that inspire them. So you kind of lay that out. You start to get different pieces, different instruments. You play, you know, the bass lines, you play the electric guitar lines, you do those different things a lot of producers do. And there's lots of times where I'll call on much um, more proficient players than myself um, for certain styles and things that I can't achieve. And so it's kind of collaborating all of those pieces and working with the artist to the point where then we go and we record the vocal take them from there into kind of post-production, mixing, mastering, and then finally to their release point where they're putting the music out typically on digital, you know, streaming sites like Spotify. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, and then it can take on lots of different forms depending on whether that's with artists or whether that's working on a television show or creating a theme for a television show. So different shoots of that, yeah. It sounds like a producer is kind of like fitting whatever places need to be fit. Yeah, there's a lot of that kind of chameleon, uh, lots of hats that we wear, um, you know, depending on what's needed. Absolutely. So if I am a, let's say I'm an artist and I have a label, let's say I actually have, a, you know, a contract with a recording company. Um, do I get to choose you as my producer? Who pays you? Yeah, in that situation, your record label would pay us or pay me or the infinites or however that would kind of work out. Um, so if if um, if you're on a record label, yeah, the record label is going to own that master that we create most likely and um, is therefore going to kind of pay um, almost to a producer more of like a service fee. And then there's also like a, a percentage royalty on the back end, depending on kind of your accolades and kind of what um, history you have, you can get higher royalties, obviously the big, big producers with tons of plaques on the wall can get a much better royalty than a starting out producer. But that's kind of how that would look like in, in town, like in Nashville. Um, and I've had the privilege to do a couple of records for labels in town and it's a really great experience. The label typically, um, you know, they want to know what you're doing and they want to be involved, but um, they're not, in my experience, not very overbearing. The artist is really driving the the creative process and then we all have to kind of submit to the label and go okay here's what we kind of came up with what do you guys think and then kind of they can go from there and decide how to market it and do all those kind of things so you're in nashville now i am in nashville now yeah and uh as a producer of course i'm sure you'd love to work with some big names and there are plenty of them floating around nashville do you go out to places and introduce yourself to people are you marketing yourself or are they finding out about you through word of mouth well, I am marketing myself and I am trying to get out and meet people, um, you know, just in, in the scene. And I, I think it's also important to just kind of be around and, and um, support these kind of local places where you can see some really great artists play, because I think that's how a lot of artists are, um, are trying out material. That's how they're meeting their producers. It's how they're putting their teams together. So yeah, there's a couple of spots that me and my wife will love to go, you know, haunt around and, and watch the, the writer's rounds and stuff. And absolutely, there's been a number of times where I'll go introduce myself to a, a particular writer that I really liked or whatever. And um, sometimes we'll write, sometimes we'll create things. Sometimes it's turned into um, doing actual records together or doing stuff for TV. So um, I, I love that, that part of just kind of organically meeting people. And then um, I do, I, I will have to say that a, a lot of the business that I'm doing is, is word of mouth. Um, a lot of it is return. And then a lot of it is, um, you know, people who have worked with me that are yeah, involved with other artists that are needing that same kind of um, person on their team and, and them finding me that way. Will other producers recommend you or is it a dog eat dog kind of a situation out there? <laughs> um, you know what I love about Nashville is it is less that way than I found in some cities. Um, it is more collaborative and more like uh, more likely that somebody might recommend another producer that might have a lean for something that they might not be able to totally nail. Um, I've done that before where it's like, oh, I, I hear what you want to do and I've got the guy for you. Like, I'm not him. Um, so I, I, I like to think that there's room for that. Um, absolutely. To, to send people, you know, here or there. I think it's kind of cool that some of the post-production and, and that kind of thing. So sometimes like a mixer will send somebody your way if they know an artist or um, a songwriter that's written with you. So, so a lot of that kind of uh, cross-pollination as well. Now, have you ever had the uh, guts to approach one of the gods? Yeah, I mean, of course, these people have worked with producers that are you know, older than me and have, you know, who knows. But I mean, have you had the courage to approach, you know, one of the vets and say, hi, you know, I really lo love to work with you. It's the stupidest thing in the world to say, but, you know, I'd love to work with you because you're awesome. <laughs> 
you know, not in a cold, not in a cold sense like that, not just walking up cold. Um, I'm pretty particular about that. I like to be, um, I like to be introduced if at all possible. It just seems to be, you kind of, there's a certain wall that is up for the general public. And in order to get behind that wall, you really do need somebody to go, hey, I need you to meet somebody. Here's, and that, that I found is the most, uh, uh, beneficial, I think, not not always possible, you know. Um, so wouldn't put it out that if I saw somebody and was like, "Man, this is my chance to go say hi," you know, I absolutely will do that. And I typically won't say something like, "I want to work with you," but I will say, "Hey, you know, my name is Ian. I really enjoy what you do. Um, love with love, would love to connect with you sometime, even just for coffee, because I find that's that's also a good way to just you know disarm, not trying to come in and get anything from you but I really like what you're doing and would love to hear more about it so that's how I like to think about it yeah I really like that I think that's good advice for anybody networking is a very difficult uh, thing to learn how to do and uh, you can easily overstep your bounds and sometimes you can make mistakes that you don't recover from for a good decade <laughs> if you make yourself obnoxious absolutely yeah 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 networking is hard well how much of this job do you consider to be art and how much of this do you consider to be commerce do you get to be the artist you want to be in most of these jobs hmm wow that's a really good question yeah i think that um in in order to do it um in order to do it full time uh there is a certain amount of it having to be commercial in a way um i am frequently thinking at, even as I'm creating um, is this does this have that the value that I want it to have is this going to be able to be used in the way that I'm needing it to be used whether it's a theme or whether it's for an artist different questions but it's that same underlying principle and so I, I really think that you kind of almost can't have one without the other in the sense that um, what is going to probably sound the best and hit people's ears the best might possibly be the most commercial thing as well. A lot of times, um, doesn't mean that there's not space for pushing, you know, boundaries and really like making a decision that is outside of the norm for a genre or for that song to make a point or to make an artistic decision. Um, but I am really, uh, I'm really conscious of what kind of the collective ear is wanting to hear and what um what is what is making people move right now and 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 also be thinking about there's kind of these currents in production that you can start to feel what's coming behind what's coming up next and so you're really kind of not listening to so much what's out now but what you hear being created and it might be coming in the next two three years um, that's kind of the game as well as to kind of try to be on that front edge as much as you can yeah well talk more about that how do you do that yeah, a lot of it is like you can go on sites like, you know, SoundCloud or you can go and, and listen to different artists that may not be in the mainstream, um, that may be smaller followings, but have really, really great material that is getting response. And so I like to just go and see what kind of new people that I haven't been listening to, not the, the ones that I'm really inspired on because everybody, they, they got the hits right now, but try to find something that is um, not yet discovered that still seems a little bit under the under the cover, or if you're in the US like I am, looking at something overseas is also helpful. Something that's popping in the UK is probably not something we're hearing on the regular here. You can kind of get something inspiring and fresh that way. And then the the kind of the, I think the master key to it is um, is to get in a time machine basically. And I, I kind of ascribe to the 25 year cycle or so it's kind of getting a little bit faster, actually. Um, so it might be closer to 20 right now. But um, I, if you go back, like, so it's 2021. If we went back about 20 years, sounds that were popular in the late 90s, early 2000s, I would bet you are going to start to be really popular in pop music, which is what I like to make. So you're, you're going to start to feel people reach back to that late 90s, early 2000s pop sound in ways and update it. And so a lot of guys, I think, are doing that. And they're listening to those records, borrowing those ideas, modernizing them. And then we kind of get the new flavors. You don't have to answer this question if it's embarrassing, but has that time machine mentality ever steered you wrong? Have you ever thought, oh yeah, in two years, we're going to be listening to polka bands and then polka <laughs> bands do not appear. 
Yes, yeah. I mean, it's it's. Um, I've definitely been wrong about it, um, and I've also had um, like misfires. So like, probably in twenty. Oh, what was that? That would have been twenty. Like thirteen, fourteen time, I started making a bunch of '80s inspired kind of dance pop stuff. And I was like, this is gonna be, this is coming super fast, like in the next couple of years. It's happening like now. <laughs> so I like, it was a little early um, on the gun. And I actually, it's funny today, I was working on a song that I created the music in that time frame years and years ago. And now an artist wants to cut the song to it today. So all the time is there, there's kind of those things where you, you're, you're close, but not quite. Um, I thought that the next thing that was going to kind of come up with some sort of grunge or some sort of like grungy type of thing. And I was right in the sense that the energy and the things that they are talking about are very grungy and a lot of pop things and having some rock mentality, but it didn't go into what, you know, Nirvana and those that, that didn't come back. Right. So right. been wrong plenty of times. <laughs> well, that's a very honest of you. And I, it's also great to hear, you know, uh, uh, you have to be wrong to be right sometimes. Uh, and uh, also, um, uh, there was another piece you put in there, which was that you saved your so-called failures, and then they turned into successes later. You uh, you didn't say, oh, I was wrong about 80s music, in the garbage can with this. No, you, hold, you held on to it, and now you're using it again. That's right. Um, in the producer world, they're called hard drive hits. Um, <laughs> and a lot of people, most producers are are carrying hundreds of these amazing tracks that uh, may or may not ever see the light of day. But yeah, I think it's important to, you kind of know when one's like, just not right, the timing's not right, but it's still a good idea. Um, there's some that you got to just toss and be done with. But uh, this one I had known, like, I like this, I, I'm going to I'm gonna hang on to this. And sure enough, worked out. Well, now you have two different kinds of clients that I'm aware of. One is a corporate client, which is a company that's looking to further their brand. And the other is a, a person that's looking to further their brand, but they're an artist. Um, and they both have, I think, the same sort of thing they're bringing to you, which is they have what they want, their vision. And you um, have to take their vision and put it in a place where you think it's gonna give them what they want. What they want may not actually be what they're asking for. And I think for companies, it can sometimes be a question of what we want. We're asking for more money and we think this is gonna give us more money versus the artist who's saying, this is my vision and I want this vision to be released. In both cases, you have to temper those things. Uh, can you talk about you know, going against the client's wishes or telling the client, no, this isn't really what you're asking for. You're actually asking for this. Hmm. Yeah, um, so I do a lot of music for like, uh, they call it sync music or, or, or synchronization. So it's it's being put to films and, and picture or advertisements or TV placements, things like that, sports, all that kind of stuff. And those are a lot of times generated by somebody, a music supervisor sending a brief and asking for um, certain types of music. And um, I, in LA, I used to, I mean, follow it to a T, exactly. Like, this is what they asked for, this is what they got. Rarely did I ever get the job, which started to make me go, what is, what am I missing here? And it's kind of what you are, are talking about, where it's that temperament between what they're asking for and what they really want delivered. Um, and a lot of times people don't know what they want is, is the funny thing. Even artists that claim to have this huge vision um, sometimes it's not as, it's more thin than you'd think as you start to push into it. And so a lot of times it's, it's kind of just working with people and walking down the road of, hey, here's what this kind of would be like if we kind of turn here. here. What do you think about that? Um, how about this flavor? How about this kind of a taste test mentality? If, mm -hmm. if the artist or company wants to be involved like that, sometimes, especially on the company side, they're like, we want it to just like, we want it to they use all these ridiculous words that aren't musical. You know, it's like, we want it to sizzle and we want it to just like bang. And like, so you really have to capture this feeling. Like you have to kind of make the spot if it's like an ad or something like, you have to understand that, first of all, in, in a lot of texts uh, or in a lot of um, contexts, the music is really secondary to what's happening. So for an artist, the music is the vehicle by which the vision is getting out to the people, but it's not even the main thing. The main thing is them as an artist is really what they're going to market and all that. So it's this kind of 
thing to always make sure that the music is supporting whatever it is being created for. And so if it's being created for an ad, like it needs to support what they shot and what the video is doing. Or if it's a theme song, like it needs to, as soon as it comes on, get the kid excited about like, this is what's gonna happen. And, and so it always has to support uh, whatever it's being created around. I can see that being a little easier with corporate clients who may to some extent understand how you have to be flexible with product to sell. Is that a little harder with artists, especially young artists who don't want to tamper with their precious music? You know, it's, it's special to them and you're trying to tell them, you know, that chord is really going to stink if you, it's not going to support you. How do you work with that? Mm. Yeah, that goes back to more of that taste testing thing. And I try to think of it as a, I try to always not close my mind off to like, no, that's the wrong decision. I try to always like ask myself, what are they really wanting to happen? Like what, and maybe, you know, they're fighting for this, like you said, maybe this chord and it's just, it actually isn't technically the right chord. We need to change it. But what do they like about it? Is the thing that, why they feel like they want that to happen. And typically I can kind of get to the question behind the question. And then I find a, a, an, a, an answer that's going to actually work musically. Yeah. Okay, I want to go one more level here because that okay. puts you, this is a wonderful, this question behind the question. I love this, but it puts you in the dangerous position of having to be a kind of a therapist to them. And you don't want to go further than that where they're totally leaning on you and saying, well, the question behind the question is that my mom's leaving me, you know? <laughs> and here, yeah, that's what's funny about it. And that's what's kind of interesting. I've been thinking about kind of documenting some of the first um, hour or two of like a songwriting session. And you would be shocked about how much of it is that. It actually is trying to go, oh, what is like, what's down there? And like, why is that? And how does that work? And what does that make you think about? And like, that really does, that is part of the process for me is to really understand where is this person at? And, and I do need to know the artist to a certain degree to really deliver for you. Like, you are gonna have to tell me some things about you that you may have reserved for like close friends, you know, but like we need to, I kind of need to understand, especially if there's a song that's carrying that message. I kind of need to know the context. Like I kind of need to know the lore behind what we're about to kind of bring in at least to some degree. So there's a lot of that actually writing that line. And then um, another, another kind of uh, extension of that is when someone is singing, you know, like when I'm actually coaching them and they're in the, in the vocal booth recording, um, there's a whole mentality of that, of how to, how to, how to correct and how not, how much not to, and how to, you know, keep the energy high so that they don't get too far, you know, in their head and start changing the way. So that's the same, even in, in a songwriting context where you're, you're kind of, you are playing kind of therapist to a certain degree, um, you know, really. And, and it's, it's really about relationships with people. Like I think some of the best music that we all love, you know, even stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think the top 40 songs, um, you know, Katy Perry or whatever, you would be surprised at how deep those conversations were that went into making that song, you know, so. And is there a give on your end too? Like if you uh, feel strongly about something and is there room for the artist to convince you that in fact, you could be more flexible as a producer? Absolutely, absolutely. I also like to, I have a, you know, a close group of, of kind of close knit producers that I will get feedback from. Um, that I think have a really good ear that I trust and I feel like they will um, being a third party they can kind of speak into things like that so if I've kind of got to like man the artist keeps wanting to do this thing like and I'll, I'll send it and I won't say anything I'll just kind of say hey what do you think of this and if I get that feedback you know what I mean if I get something that's similar to that from somebody else I will bow out you know like hey I, I really I got some feedback on this and I think you're right I think we should stick with that or um uh, happens all the time, so. Well, let's talk about I Found Myself. Uh, tell me, first of all, how you got introduced to this project in the first place. Uh, wait, we'd better talk about, there are some people that don't even know what this is. Talk about the song. Yeah, so this was a song that was um, written by a guy named David Falkenstein, and he has um, his daughter, who, who also wrote it with him. And it is a song about as you can imagine by the title, finding yourself and finding your your kind of your true self and letting go of some of the things that um, 
maybe have been told to you over time and maybe have built up and maybe have um, weighed you down. And it's kind of that breaking free of those kind of chains and that kind of song. Um, so it's very inspiring, very uplifting, very, um, you know, great for the times too, just given what, what everybody's kind of going through. And um, so I got introduced to that whole crew of people through Josh Misko. Um, and he had uh, his, I, th I believe that they were working with with David in a number of, of ways representing him. And so this was something that he was working on and they reached out needing production um, to try to, at first it was really just to have something that was going to kind of be for um, like kind of a memorandum of the song. They were going to cut this song. They, were, they brought in their own band initially um, that was a bunch of David's friends and stuff like that from the Atlanta area. And it was going to be so that the, the writers in the band had something to remember this song by because they thought that they were likely going to get it cut by somebody. So another artist was going to come in and actually perform the song that they had written. So they just had a demo that they had released on um, SoundCloud and, uh, and like Song Kick and some other places like that. And then they had, you know, that they wanted to make a, a studio version of that. So that was how I initially brought on was just to make this studio version, the studio experience um, for the band. And so they were going to have some video taken. It was going to be this really cool couple of days in the studio. So we um, rented a Starstruck studio here in Nashville, which is a really beautiful, awesome room. Um, has been graced by everyone uh, from Kelly Clarkson on down. So really cool spot, um, lots of history. So we went in there, cut the band over a couple of days. Um, Courtney was the singer, um, gave a fantastic performance on the second day, um, had all that material, produced the rest of it out over the following weeks with Josh as we kind of co-produced it together, um, relayed guitars and different things like that. Um, as we got farther down the road, David started kind of liking what we were getting and was like, hey, I don't know, we might pause on maybe, um, you know, doing something else with this, maybe we should run with this version, I kind of want to, um, to use it for fundraising purposes for these different organizations and, you know, what do you guys think about that and so obviously we all wanted to try to push the message. And so we finished it out, kind of went through the whole mix and mastering post-production process and, uh, you know, released it and had some, some great response, had a couple of, like I mentioned, um, NAMI and Eden and a couple others um, kind of take it on and use it as a kind of a fight song for their, uh, for their organizations and stuff like that. Um, and I believe there's going to be a lot of more like news coverage and things like that in the following uh, weeks and months. We did a live video in Atlanta um, that will be airing on different um, local, you know, television stations and stuff like that. Um, it's been getting some radio play. And like you mentioned, the TikTok numbers are really awesome and, and Spotify as well. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, but um, it's been an amazing project to be a part of. Um, Josh, as I'm sure you heard in the interview is a great guy um amazing producer as well and player and uh yeah that our whole... guitar teacher absolutely we and, know yeah there you go yeah you guys know that and you firsthand know so um the one thing we haven't really said explicitly is that this song uh, uh means something to people because it's it's not just about finding ourselves it's about body image and positivity and like people you know telling you you know your body is wrong it doesn't look right or you know the way you present yourself in the world you know is not the way we need to present ourselves as human beings so a lot of different groups have latched onto this song uh, you mentioned eden and uh these these other groups but we don't you haven't mentioned what those groups are or what they yes. do yes uh, yes yeah, good point. Um, the the song really comes from, and I think the personal experience behind some of the songs is like you mentioned, an, an eating disorder and having some of this body image, um, you know, shame and different things like that. And I know that that's, that's definitely within the song. They also wanted to kind of leave it open to LGBTQ issues, to trans, I mean, all those kind of different issues that have to do with body image and, and um, kind of societal norms and things like that. So yes, lots of, lots of that, even in the music video, you'll notice that a lot of that kind of imagery is used and you'll see the kind of different storylines that are, that are said in that music video, um, do play at that and show more of that, um, more of that side of kind of where the writers were, were coming from on it. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely heavy, heavy into that. And I know that's the personal experience from where the song really was birthed. And how do you feel about uh, being able to be a part of a song that means so much to so many different kinds of folks? I think it's amazing. I, I tell Josh all the time um, as we're kind of getting updates and stuff that you just don't get to do projects like this very often. 
you just don't um you know there's there's a lot of cool projects out there but rarely is there a group of people that's really as special as this crew and um just the heart behind it and what they want to see done with it and and what's been done already it's just it's really a cool thing and so it's been a um kind of a I don't know, a, a, a kind of a magical experience, almost, honestly, every time I've gotten to work on it, it's just been really, really awesome. The people that I've met and hearing the responses from people, that's, as a producer, that's the biggest reward you can have is to see people enjoy what you've created and, um, and, and get some sort of meaning from it. And so for it to be even more meaningful than just like, wow, that was a great track or that theme is really cool or whatever, but this song, you know, this song got me through something or this song really, you know, helped me hold on to something and realize that, you know, I needed to make that change or I needed to say that to this person or I needed to, to come out with this. That that's it. I mean, I think that's all we can ever hope for. So. Yeah. Well, the, the song is obviously everywhere, but it would be helpful for folks to know where they could specifically find it easily. Can you uh, clue us in? Yeah, absolutely. If you're on Spotify, Apple Music, it's going to be by the Superstones is going to be the name of the artist. And it's going to be called I Found Myself. So you can search it that way. Um, on YouTube, if you type in I Found Myself, the Superstones, you're going to come up with all the different um, pieces that they have up there. There's some behind the scene things, I think, and some some kind of documentary pieces that I believe are out there along with the music video. So those are the easiest ways to find it. Okay. And supposing folks would like to work with you because uh, you've represented yourself very well, I would love to work with you. How can I contact you to discuss a project? Absolutely. Um, two ways. One, you can go to the infinitesmusic.com, the infinite plural music.com. Um, and there you'll see my production duo that I have with my production partner, Cash Calloway, also based in Nashville. Um, you can see some of our past work. Uh, you can contact us there. If you'd also like to just reach out to me um, uh, directly, my email is ian at osborntx.com. And any questions are welcome if you're learning production or you're trying to um, find out what next steps to take with your project. I'd love to hear from you. That's fantastic. Well, Ian Osborne, thank you so much for talking with us. I hope you get a lot more projects like I found myself for you. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. And folks, uh, if you have any questions or you're unable to find Ian, uh, you can contact us at, uh, you can contact me directly at adam at willowschoolga.com. Uh, we would be happy to hear from you. Um, you're also welcome to find us at our website at uh, truermu.com. Uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact us. We're excited to have you joining us on this video and look for us on other videos. We've got some amazing guests coming up. Be sure you like our videos if you're enjoying them and we'll see you next time.